Hi. Hi, Lucas. Some people saying hi. Hello. Hello. Hi, Rafael from Floripa. Hi, Rafael. Oh, from Floripa. <laughs> That's great. Hi, Rodrigo from Sao Paulo. <laughs> hi from Rio. Hi, Felipe. Hello. Hello, Flavio. I'm Lika. Hi. Santos, Recife, Sao Paulo. Curitiba in the house. Brasília. Porto Alegre. Okay, so we already have plenty of people here. We have 100, uh, almost uh, 120, oh, 23, 24, 25 people. So I'm going to start by um, introducing myself to you. For those who do not know me, uh, my name is Rodrigo Garcia Rosa. Um, I am a lecturer at Faculdade de Cultura Inglesa. Uh, and there right now um, I teach uh, in the undergraduate, uh, undergraduate course and in the postgraduate course too, uh, for which I serve as uh, the post-graduation coordinator too. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for uh, attending this, this conversation, right? I'm not going to uh, call it a talk, uh, but for attending this conversation in which we're going to talk about something that is really dear to me, that is uh, second language acquisition and uh, bilingualism. So I should start by telling you that, um, as the name here itself says and suggests, I'm going to talk about some key concepts of the two, um, you know, research areas. Let's say, uh, but under no circumstances do I aim at exhausting the uh, discussion on these uh, two areas of knowledge and, and of research because they're quite big. Okay. Uh, and in this um, conversation, I'm, I'm actually going to have this broad perspective that um, it's a kind of personal perspective too, but also based on uh, the research that has been produced in, in these two areas, which is a much more unified version of what, what we understand about second language acquisition and bilingualism, right? So uh, in a nutshell, uh, what I'll, I'll try to do here is uh, at first, uh, to try to unify these two areas of research and to find the commonalities between these two research agendas um, um, based on the literature, the existing literature uh, on, on both of them, okay? So uh, this is the uh, outline that we have for today's presentation, um, conversation. So we're going to talk about second language acquisition and bilingualism, so the main foci um, basic concepts and, and divergences and convergences. And uh, as you can see, this uh, presentation is divided into two parts. So part one and part two. Uh, in the second one, we're going to talk a little bit more about the nature of uh, learner language. And um, uh, luckily, we're going to try to go from, we're going to try, and luckily, we're going to go from theory to uh, practice. Okay. So if that sounds like a plan for you, uh, I would like you to start thinking about the process of second language acquisition. So here the title says uh, second language acquisition or bilingualism. If we go for uh, some uh, existing definitions of what um, acquisition is, um, there's no way in which we're going to define what acquisition is uh, and not and not contrasted with uh, the idea of learning a language, okay? And more specifically, when uh, um, different theories of language, and one specifically comes to, to, to everybody's mind when we think about acquisition, is uh, generativism, okay? So to, generativist, uh, to generativists or generative uh, linguistics, uh, there is a very, very, very clear difference between the concepts of um, acquiring a first or a foreign language and um, learning a second language, right? So this is one of the um, very famous dichotomies that we have uh, in the area of e ELT, but also in general linguistics. Um, but if we go for a definition of what acquisition is and narrowing down to um, the definition of what second language acquisition is, uh, David Crystal in his uh, Dictionary of Linguistics and Phonetics says, that acquisition is also used in the context of learning a foreign language, foreign 
or second language is thus distinguished from first language or mother tongue acquisition. In this context, acquisition is sometimes opposed to learning, as I said previously. Uh, the former is viewed as an environmentally natural process, the primary force behind uh, foreign language fluency. The latter is, um, is seen as an instructional process which takes place in a teaching context, guiding the performance of the speaker. So at first glance, we see that um, one of the uh, uh, confusions that we have uh, regarding um, second language acquisition is somehow um, solved here, right? Uh, we know that um, BLT literature and the literature in general differentiates what uh, a second language is from foreign language, from what a foreign language is. But if we take the definition of second language acquisition here provided by uh, David Crystal, so we already see that uh, both foreign language and second language uh, could be grouped under the agenda of uh, second language acquisition, right? So this is the first problem that we're trying to solve here. And apparently the definitions of second language acquisition already deal with uh, such a problem, okay? So let me just get some water. So in other words, uh, second language acquisition and foreign language acquisition somehow would be grouped under the idea of, um, under the uh, agenda of the umbrella of second language acquisition uh, research. Um, what about bilingualism? What, uh, does a th uh, what does the literature have to say about uh, bilingualism? So. I brought here the uh, lexical entry uh, also from David Crystal's uh, Dictionary of Linguistics, but obviously I'm not gonna read everything, it's quite big, but I've selected uh, a couple of parts from uh, what, from a couple of parts which are interesting for us to contrast with the idea of second language acquisition. So here it says bilingual, the general sense of the term, a person who can speak two languages. Okay, a person who can speak two languages is generally considered a bilingual. So anybody uh, taking part in this in this uh, conversation, myself included, and you who are listening to this uh, and making sense of the things, agreeing, disagreeing, objecting to what I'm saying here so far, uh, could consider uh, themselves. You could could consider yourselves bilingual speakers if we go for the general sense of the term. So a person who is able to speak two different languages, right? This definition provides a pre-theoretical frame of reference for linguistic study, uh, especially by social linguistics and by applied linguistics involved in foreign and second language teaching. So although I haven't um, highlighted here, I should have uh, the words foreign and second language. Why is that? Because this, from um, you know, from a so much more um, related to a social linguistic perspective, is directly connected with what we we have just mentioned. That is second language acquisition. So we have here involved in foreign or second language teaching. It contrasts with monolingual. This perspective of uh, bilingual or bilingualism is contrast contrasted with an idea of a monolingual individual, so one who speaks only one language. The focus of attention has been on the many kinds and degrees of bilingualism and bilingual situations which exist. Definitions of bilingualism reflect assumptions about the degree of proficiency people must achieve before they qualify as individuals. That's one of the uh, problematic areas of uh, assessing what uh, a real a uh, bilingual individual would be. Uh, how do you personally consider um, someone as a bilingual individual or not, considering the fact that language itself has many different dimensions of uh, communication? In other words, um, could we uh, qualify as bilingual an individual who is able to perform um, well in a foreign language but more specifically in writing because that's basically what he does with a foreign language he writes articles for instance uh could we consider someone 
uh, a bilingual individual, if that particular person is able to follow talks in English and um, is able to understand in his own context, professional context, everything that has to be understood. So there are various, um, various different perspectives to what uh, being a bilingual individual is, considering the dimensions of language that we have. Um, so we're going to have some time to talk about um, about this because some people are reacting here. They're saying strongly disagree, strongly disagree with this perspective. So um, this this area of of research that is how to assess a bilingual individual is a very hot hot topic nowadays. Okay. Um, having said that, the perspective that I'm going to adopt here is one that is a more recent perspective to what an, a bilingual individual or a second language user uh, is. Um, according to Lynch, uh, in a publication in 2015, he says, in a recent editorial uh, for the journal Behavioral uh, Neurology, the authors uh, here mentioned have highlighted that in the age of globalization, bilingualism will become ever more prevalent. Quite clearly, their definition of the bilingual individual in the global era was highly inclusive of L2 users. So to these researchers specifically, the boundaries between the boundaries between uh, what a bilingual individual is, uh, what a uh, bilingual individual is, and what a second language user of the language is, they're kind of broken, okay? So from an age, in, in the age of global, globalization, in which the boundaries, the national boundaries are broken because we um, communicate internationally here. Uh, I have a lot of people from, from different parts of the, different parts of the world, yeah? Um, it doesn't actually make that much of a sense to differentiate bilingual individuals and second language users. Obviously, we're not saying that uh, the bilingual um, individual, those bilingual individuals who are born in bilingual contexts and have learned and have acquired two languages um, in, in, um, um, together as they grew up and matured should be considered the same thing as uh, very proficient L2 users of any language. That's not basically what I'm saying, right? But uh, the uh, bilingual ag agenda and research has taken on board a number of individuals who do not conform or comply with this particular context and scenario of, um, you know, second, uh, first and second language acquisition. Uh, so if that is the case, this definition is one that unifies the idea and the agendas of second language acquisition and bilingualism. So what do the authors say? In general, a bilingual speaker may be someone with different levels of proficiency in the two languages, right? In the two languages. Uh, we have to stop and think about the fact that sometimes we're not as advanced in our own first language, given one specific communicative dimension, say writing, yeah, or giving talks in our own uh, first language, if compared to a second language. So we have different dimensions. And here, what the definition says is a bilingual speaker may be someone with different levels of proficiency in the two languages. Using the two languages in different contexts or learning a new language due to, edu due to educational requirements, immigration, or other business and life demands. By this definition, a bilingual individual is not only necessarily someone who has acquired both languages from birth, as I was discussing, or early in life, but also one who learns a second language later in life. In other words, somebody who has mastered a foreign language as a foreign language learner could also be considered given this definition of bilingualism, a bilingual individual, okay? Um, so if you don't mind, uh, I'm going to leave a couple of minutes at the end of this presentation for us to discuss in case you have some questions, right? So you might ask as many questions as you want, but uh, I'd like you to, to, to keep your questions to yourself. 
um, so that we, we, we go back to these afterwards. Okay, thank you. Um, so a road, a roadmap to uh, SLA and bilingualism. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, this. Well, I like metaphors, and I think that a way of uh, coming up with a definition to uh, what the second language uh, acquisition process and the bilingual process, um, the, at least the storage of information to a bilingual individual, is is coming up with a metaphor. So if you look at this, uh, if you look at this picture and you think about a metaphor, this as a metaphor uh, to explain the phenomenon of second language acquisition, what would you say? Um, how do, how would how would you say this metaphor is an appropriate metaphor to explain the process of second language acquisition, the pieces of a puzzle being put together? So how would you how would you say this? So you can uh, you can contribute here in the chat box. I'll read some of your contributions. So how good do you think this metaphor? Okay, Leah says it's a process. Eternally trying to put pieces together, the way we process our thinking, right? Languages are all connected, Thiago, Thiago says. <laughs> chunk by chunk. Okay, connections, Carla says. Okay, any other contribution to that? If we stop to think about the process of uh, putting the pieces of a puzzle together when we have to do this, so somebody says, uh, it would be compared to our brain. Rodrigo Queiroz says that. Okay, I use this metaphor for myself today as I'm learning Japanese, Evandro says, relating pieces of information, right. So if we think about the process of really putting the pieces of a puzzle together, so we can think about a, a couple of characteristics, right? So. We have one very specific aim with that. It has been ages I haven't played. I haven't tried to put one together. But uh, you know, if I remember it correctly, what we do generally is we get a picture that we have to follow. And then we get all of the pieces and we try to put them together, right? Uh, but question, do you think that there might be some strategies for us to put the pieces of a puzzle together? Can think of strategies? Yes, for example, start with the edges. Livia <laughs> says, okay, borders first, start with corners, patterns and colors. Interesting, interesting. So let's suppose that I have different sizes of these pieces, right? And different colors. So an interesting thing that I could do is like to group those pieces that are bigger and cluster them around, you know, a specific area on the floor and then take, uh, you know, smaller pieces and put them together in another pile, let's say. Um, and how would you start? How would you start from the corners, you would say? Yeah, some of you said from the corners. Okay, so we can start from the corners and by observing the picture and trying to put the pieces together, right? What might happen if um, it's the picture of a landscape, for example? Okay, you might have to think about the shapes, how one piece fits with another, fits with another, right? But can't you run the risk i mean i mean don't you constantly run the risk of putting two pieces that form wise go together but you advance into the creation or um, into the process of putting the, put, putting these pieces together to later on discover that you have placed some pieces inaccurately then you have to restructure all of the process it happens, doesn't it? Elena says, it happens. So you try a first time, you're able to put the pieces together. So formally speak, speaking, they fit together. But then later on, you discover that the pieces do not actually come up with, uh, I mean, they do not uh, compose the image that you were looking for, right? And what do you have to do when you do this, this thing? 
when you make this mistake, you have to reconstruct, rethink, Carla says, try again, right? So you have to try to look at that image, reorder. You have to look at that image and try to say, well, where, exact, where exactly have I gone wrong? Which one piece or two pieces could I take and replace, reorganize the things? So this is basically one of the reasons why I like this metaphor so much to characterize the process of learning a foreign language, right? A foreign or a second language. Um, uh, the area of cognitive linguistics, which is the one, my, the, the research agenda I personally subscribe to and I, and I do research to, I did research to uh, in my PhD. Um, there is this idea, this, you know, uh, uh, permeating idea that constructing um, learning a second language means actually constructing a second language by learning the pieces that compose this bigger picture that is the second language. And just like in a process of uh, putting the pieces of a puzzle together, we constantly have to restructure, reconstruct the things by perceiving that the pieces that I have structured and pieced together with other pieces um, are not well put. So I have to reconstruct uh, constantly this uh, language that I'm creating, okay? So um, I hope you like the, uh, the metaphor, uh, but there, there is a very interesting thing that is, uh, there is a publication uh, by, um, uh, it's the uh, Introduction to Second Language Acquisition uh, textbook, and one of the very last chapters uh, basically deals with different metaphors to explain the, the process of uh, the phenomenon of second language opposition. So this is one metaphor that I personally like, but you could go for different uh, metaphors. Yeah, you could certainly go for different metaphors. Um, let, me, let me just read one thing here. Evandro says, learning or acquiring languages and solving puzzles are more fun when there are others to help and be helped. That's true. That's true. There are a couple of things that we could um, enlist here. Like there is a very clear objective. There is a target. We could be helped and we could help the others. It's fun. It's a joy, right? There, there are a couple of psychological, social, and cognitive things that we could uh, mention here. Uh, but the time is, con I'm constrained by the time. Otherwise, we're just going to talk about the how this metaphor is an appropriate one for the phenomenon of second language acquisition. Anyways, uh, although you could go for um, you know your own metaphor to explain the process, um, I have gone for this one, and this sort of introduces the questions that I'm uh, I, I'll try to answer uh, throughout this talk here. So the first one then is, what is second language acquisition, and how is it connected to bilingualism? So I think that somehow I have already answered this with the literature. So I'm putting both things together. I'm trying to characterize the second language speaker as a bilingual speaker and as a speaker rather than as a learner, okay? The second question is, uh, what are the main research agendas in the area? Which are the main issues in second language acquisition and bilingualism? And which perspectives can we adopt to do second language or bilingual research? This is uh, for those who are interested in doing some research on uh, second language acquisition or bilingualism, that should be a, an interesting question. So. If we go uh, uh, to a very basic definition of what uh, second language acquisition is, uh, considering the individuals that I have uh, talked about, okay, considering the uh, types of the uh, kinds of individuals that I have described, in other words, those who are able to communicate in a foreign language, a definition to SLA would be uh, the systematic study. Just a just a very quick question, guys. Can you hear me well? because my computer here says my connection is not good. Can you hear me well? See me? Thanks. Thank you for the feedback. So uh, back to the definition here, a very simple, uh, even simplistic definition of uh, what SLA is, is um, we could say it's the systematic study of how people acquire a second language, okay? So it's a systematic study of how people acquire a second language. But such, a, such an apparently um, simple uh, answer 
to a very complex question that is, what is, this, uh, what is second language acquisition, hides um, some, some other questions that we have to ask ourselves. So when the sentence says, uh, when, when we say in the sentence, systematic study of how people acquire, acquire a, a, a second language, who are these people? So are these people who are only formally being exposed to a foreign language? Or are we taking on board everybody who is having to interact and communicate in a foreign language? In other words, does the research ag agenda take on board people who have immigrated to a country where they have to use, let's say, English as their means of communication? Are we talking about the children of foreigners? Are we talking about students who are learning a foreign language in a regular school context? Are we also taking the foreign language learners? Considering our multilingual, uh, multilingual context, it could be a variety of social actors, Rodrigo says. Yes, and the answer to uh, the answer given by SLA research to these individuals, so when it's a systematic study of how people, who are these people, everybody who formally or informally study or has to acquire or has to study a foreign language. So it turns out that in Brazil, most of the second language acquisition research that is conducted is done with foreign language learners. I have done it myself in my PhD with a group of Brazilian, um, I have done it with uh, you know, a group of Brazilian speakers, uh, uh, Brazilian Portuguese L1, and um, um, Spanish speakers from Spain, uh, because I did it with uh, the, the acquisition of English grammatical constructions by uh, speakers of four uh, Romance languages, uh, Brazilian, Portuguese, French, Italian, and uh, Spanish. So I have taken all of the uh, learners that have, that have informed my, my, my research, my PhD research, uh, were foreign language um, learners, not necessarily uh, children of foreigners living in the United States and having to learn how to speak English in order to communicate. No, uh, they were foreign language um, learners, right? Uh, but uh, in the United States or um, in Canada or in the UK, there are lots and lots and lots of um, um, research projects being conducted with children of foreigners who have immigrated to, uh, to these countries, yeah? I also spent part of my, my, my PhD, PhD in England, and uh, much of the research conducted there about bilingualism revolves around these contexts of bilingual education uh, at the school, regular school level. So who are these people? Everyone. Everyone who uh, formally or informally has to learn how to communicate in a foreign language. So the second question already um, uh, was already anticipated somehow. So are they learners? Not necessarily. So if we have immigrate uh, immigrants, like Brazilian immigrants to the United States, and who have to communicate in a foreign language in English in this specific uh, in this particular case, uh, those could be a group of learners that could compose uh, a group of um, you know um, a research group, right? Um, Carla says, I'm Brazilian and I communicate with Spanish and that is not living in Australia that has a son who speaks English. If you can understand a foreign language and also make you understandable to people as well, then you are bilingual, right? Uh, Tatiani says this, this is a very interesting um, um, context, let's say, because there are various interesting uh, research projects that um, check the level of two or three or four different languages and they try to determine the extent to which you could be called bilingual or multilingual because you are able to operate in three four or five different languages okay 
So it it goes back to what we were discussing. It depends a lot on what's your definition of what uh, a bilingual individual is. And this is really hard to assess because uh, the fact that you're a native speaker of one particular language, everybody is, uh, at least one, uh, doesn't necessarily guarantee that your communicative competence in that particular language will be uh, great in every dimension of the language. So it goes back to what I said. Uh, the fact that you were born and raised in Brazil and who, and if you went to college and uh, if you get a postgraduate course or anything, doesn't actually mean that you write well, for instance, that you communicate well in written Portuguese. Uh, so you are a native speaker of Brazilian Portuguese and that, that doesn't necessarily make you a wonderful um, communicator in writing. So it's really hard to measure the uh, different dimensions uh, and uh, as a consequence of this to use language proficiency to define what um, um, a bilingual individual is. Okay, so going back to our sentence here, systematic study of how people acquire a second language. So what is acquire? So a question that we have to ask ourselves. Uh, as I said previously, the uh, literature, especially um, generative literature, has differentiated the concepts of acquisition and learning and uh, by saying that acquisition is a much more naturalistic process if compared to learning. So there is um, an age of maturity for you uh, uh, to acquire a language naturalistically as opposed to learning a language, which you could do until the day, till the day you die, right? So um, how do we go about this distinction between acquisition as a more naturalistic process versus learning, which is generally considered to be a more formal kind of thing and um, rational kind of thing, so to speak. Um, the current uh, research agenda on second language acquisition, once again, especially from a cognitive linguistics uh, perspective, break uh, this paradigm and does not actually make that much of a difference between acquiring a language and learning a language. Um, this goes in line with what I told you that the view, the basic, uh, the basic view for second language acquisition from a cognitive perspective is one that you construct a foreign language just like you construct a first language. For those interested in this perspective, uh, a wonderful book that talks about first language acquisition is Constructing a Language by Michael Tomazello. Although he talks about the first language acquisition context, this, uh, you know, paves the way for a lot of uh, research, wonderful research uh, done uh, from a cognitive perspective on second language acquisition, uh, for which a very big name is um, Nick Allies, okay? Professor Nick Allies. Uh, so, and then the last one we have here is second language. So, systematic study of how people acquire a second language, second or foreign? So I told you that I did research in Brazil, okay? I did research in Brazil with Brazilian learners going to the English course twice a week and having, you know, something around three, hour of formal, three hours of formal instruction uh, a week. So do you think that I did second language acquisition or foreign language acquisition research in my PhD. Additional, for, okay. <laughs> some people are adding some other terms like additional, yes. Okay, the uh, Asselet research will say, although it is a foreign language context, in other words, the, the learners do not have, do not necessarily have to interact in English outside the classroom, both foreign language instruction and, you know, a real second language acquisition context, say, children of immigrants living in the United States, learning English as a, as a second language, both situations could be considered second language acquisition. Okay, so we do have a difference between these two concepts, right? So foreign, somebody who has formal instruction in the foreign language but doesn't have to use that language out of the classroom. And second language, somebody who has to use that, that, that language to interact 
in real life, let's say, outside the classroom. But for second language acquisition research, both contexts are considered SLA. Okay? Uh, so far, so good. So uh, I told you that I was going to answer a couple of questions, right? Uh, and uh, they were, what are the main research agendas and what are the main issues? We still have to answer those things. Uh, so going for, what are the goals of second language acquisition? So uh, some of the questions that we can ask ourselves is like, okay, uh, when, uh, I would like to do some research on second language acquisition, but how can I go about researching what goes on in the minds, in the cognition of my second language learner. So how exactly? Uh, more often than not, uh, the sort of, uh, it depends a lot on what you want to research, okay? And uh, because SLA could be viewed from various different angles, so you could, you could do some research on how learners um, view the process of learning a foreign language. So this would be a sort of metacognitive uh, piece of research, which is a very important thing, a psychological factor, a wonderful uh, piece of research to be conducted. But this is very different from doing um, a piece of research that is concerned about the processing of, say, grammatical structures in the foreign language or um, the mastery of one particular uh, sequence of phonemes um, etc., or um, a set of lexical items, etc., etc., etc. In other words, what I'm saying is you can study qualitatively the ideas that one has about second language acquisition, the uh, social aspects of uh, what it means to learn a foreign language, the cultural aspects of what it means to learn a foreign language, but you could also go for more uh, raw things, let's say. Uh, you could go for more linguistic aspects of what uh, knowing a second language is. More often than not, if you want to assess these qualitative aspects of what it means to learn a foreign language from a social, cultural, or um, uh, from a social or cultural perspective or psychological perspective, uh, you could you could make use of interviews, generally speaking. Okay. But if you're interested in really collecting data and seeing how the cognition of a group of learners is responding to a certain kind of stimulus or how the storage of a kind of uh, language construction uh, is being uh, done, you could go for samples of learner language. And nowadays we have lots of uh, learner corpora available out there that we could use. And how can this sort of um, uh, data, interviews and samples of language, uh, of learning language, how can this shed some light on second language development? Because more often than not, what we are concerned with is what sort of stimulus should I uh, give to my learners so that they are uh, able to learn, to master this construction in a more efficient manner? Um, so how can I do this? By measuring longitudinal uh, development, okay? So I can observe through longitudinal analyses because they serve, the, they serve the purpose of describing how learned language changes over time. And this is what uh, uh, the research on, on second language acquisition has done uh, so far. It has observed how the development of uh, learned language, which is considered, it's not considered traditionally, as the sum of the first language and the second language, but rather a third thing. This is something that we're not going to talk about uh, today's, today, but um, that's basically the concept of interlanguage, right? So it's the language that is, it's not a language, the, the interlanguage could, should not be viewed as a mathematical sum of the knowledge that one has about the first language with the second language. No. The, the learner language or the interlanguage will be a third thing, okay? Uh, so the longitudinal analysis serves the purpose of describing how learner language changes over time. And can it account for why this is so? Why is that? In other words, 
what sort of things are we trying to do when we go for longitudinal analysis of a group of learners with the aim of describing learner language itself? We have to do this because we are trying to describe the processes through which the learner language goes, aiming at what in linguistics we call explanatory adequacy. In other words, we are trying to understand why they do what they do and why learner language follows the way it follows, okay? Obviously, if one of the objectives of second language acquisition is to try to create and come up with a stimulus or a stimuli, a teaching stimuli, which is more effective, if I can anticipate what the um, direction, let's say, of second language acquisition is, I can try to think of bad, better uh, instruction uh, or better, um, you know, name it, you name it, teaching materials or methodologies, different ways in which we could solve the uh, problems that we can already anticipate, okay? Uh, still on, on the question of what are the goals of second language acquisition and more specifically uh, on the, the idea of uh, explanatory adequacy. Chomsky 1964 says that a linguistic theory that aims for explanatory adequacy is concerned with the mental structure of the device, that is grammar, that is, it aims to provide a principled basis independent of any particular language for the selection of the descriptively adequate grammar of each language. In other words, we're trying to discover what the internal structure of this third language is, okay? So uh, to use a chunk that is very commonly used in second language acquisition theory, we're trying to um, verify what the learner, how the learner is making sense of the foreign material he is being, he or she, uh, they are being exposed to. Okay, uh, but all of this conversation might make us think that we are ignoring the social and the cultural aspects of what it, of what learning a foreign language um, is. So another question we have to ask, we constantly have to ask ourselves is like, are the driving forces of second language acquisition always internal? And the answer is already here. The answer is no. We have uh, to account for metacognitive factors. We have to account for, we have to consider that there is a very specific social milieu. Uh, we have social conditions and attitudes that we have to uh, pay attention to. The quality of the input to which um, learners will be exposed is a very important factor too. Uh, how does world knowledge of the learners contribute or hinder, let's say, the process of second language acquisition. And what about linguistic knowledge, like language aptitude, for example, which is one of the areas, uh, one of the debated areas in cognitive linguistics, in second language acquisition, okay? Okay, so um, Maria says, external stimuli can help a lot. That's right. So all of these factors, they have to be taken on board. They have to be taken into consideration. And um, why is this important? Because we have to remember that doing SLA research is necessarily dealing with a multifaceted uh, thing. So there are a couple of things that we have to account for, uh, and these are: we have to go for we have to account for methodological aspects. So if we're trying to compile a, um, um, a set of data to analyze, say, the uh, longitudinal uh, development of a certain grammatical tense. We have to control for variables like the age, uh, international experience, um, number of hours of exposure, if we're talking about foreign language learners, right? Uh, 
whether the person really uh, uses that language or not on a regular basis, professionally and culturally too. So lots of different variables for us to control if we want to do this. This is a social factor. Uh, we have to we have to account for uh, psychological factors too. So I have mentioned one of them that is aptitude, but everybody knows that there is another psychological factor which plays a determining a determining role in how successful you're going to be with a second language context. That is that is motivation, right? So language aptitude is a very important thing. But motivation is another very important thing. Um, we are talking about uh, psychological factors here, but uh, we could think about social factors like how, which are connected, how motivated do you think uh, that the children of immigrants are going to be to learn a foreign language if the children of the children of those uh, immigrants are children of immigrants who come from a country that is not well seen in the country where they immigrated to. Right? We, we all know that uh, in certain regions of the United States, um, just like in every part of the world, we have groups of people who do not welcome well immigrants. So my thing is, how do you think a, a Mexican or a Colombian or a Brazilian would feel uh, having to learn English and communicate in this foreign language if the treatment that this person gets there is not a very good treatment? So this is a social aspect that we have to account for, right? And the third and the third characteristic, one which I personally think that is a very interesting one, and people have been researching a lot about, uh, this is very, 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 uh, this is a very, 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 very hot topic nowadays, the descriptive factors. So how the interrelated linguistic structures play a role in determining what you're looking for. I'm going to try to explain with an example. Let's suppose that you're trying to, uh, you want to know, um, about more about the acquisition of um, the past tense construction um, in English. And then uh, what you're actually doing if you were concerned with these descriptive factors is the theory says that the simple past is somehow connected linguistically with the uh, present perfect. So if there is this connection between these two verb tenses, I'm going to measure the extent to which stimulus on the teaching of present perfect will have some sort of uh, effect on the learning of simple past. So what I'm trying, uh, what I'm telling you is, if they are interconnected, if these two grammatical constructions are inherently interconnected, some sort of effect should be felt in this particular construction, in the acquisition of this particular construction, if I change or if I uh, cause, if I, you know, um, um, provide some sort of stimulus, uh, teaching stimulus on this particular construction because they're connected. So it's what they're actually, uh, what they're currently testing is the extent to which the, um, stimulus in one particular grammatical construction will affect the acquisition of another one. So this is a very, very, very interesting um, area of research. But as I said to you previously, um, we have to account for all of these things, right? When we're doing uh, research on second language acquisition, be it in a PhD context or even when we are observing and trying to help our learners uh, in the classroom. Uh, I would like to sum up this uh, perspective by telling you then that we can do uh, research um, on second language acquisition or bilingual education from various different perspectives. So this is one of them. 
uh, it's a triangle, right? So we, we can do it from the perspective of linguistics. And if we decide to adopt this vantage point of the language to observe the phenomenon of second language opposition, we can definitely adopt the perspective of language to do this. But we cannot ignore the fact that we, we do have psychological factors coming in the way, and we do have social factors coming in the way. But at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the day, if I am adopting the linguistic perspective, I'm doing SLA research from the perspective of linguistics. So I'm looking at um, the phenomenon itself, and my ultimate objective at the end is to characterize the acquisition of language patterns. But instead, I should I don't necessarily have to do uh, SLA research from this perspective. I could be adopting this perspective, that is psychology. In other words, I could be worried about psychological factors and how they come in the way of acquiring a foreign language, but I cannot ignore the fact that language plays a role and the social aspect plays a role. And last but definitely not least, the social factor too. I could be adopting the social perspective, but just like in the other, from the other perspectives, I cannot ignore the existence of these two other spheres, uh, the linguistic aspect and the psychological aspect. Uh, I would love to spend the whole afternoon with you talking about this, which is uh, something that um, is, is really dear to me. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't, have to, uh, we didn't have the time to talk about the nature of learner language. I, was, I have brought some um, some uh, data, some learner data for us to look at and try to see the uh, errors and mistakes and the systematicity of those things. But uh, the only thing I can tell you is that this semester we're going to uh, have a course on second language acquisition, an extension course on second language acquisition um, being offered by Faculdade de Cultura Inglesa. I will be the teacher of this um, uh, extension course. It's going to start on the 23rd of April. It's a 12-hour course, so it's, it's going to be on Thursdays from 2 to 4 uh, in the afternoon. So if you're interested in uh, discovering a little bit more about second language acquisition and bilingualism, and how these two things combine together and really have some time for us to go into uh, the analysis of real learner data, uh, you, can join, um, you can join us there, right? So we still have seven minutes for questions. Uh, so if you, other than thank you very much for taking part, I hope you have taken something from, from this very brief conversation. Um, yeah, part two would be fine. I, I also agree with you. I'm really sorry for not being able to, to reach it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so do we have any? Oh, Nick, just a question. Uh, can you tell me again the name of the, that author whose first name is Nick? Uh, his first name is Nick. His last name is Ali, double L. And I'm not talking about Rod Ellis, who is also a second language acquisition researcher, right? Uh, who is a great second language acquisition research, but researcher, by the way. Um, no, I'm talking about Nick Ellis, not Rod Ellis. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you. Do we have any questions? Can you share this material with us? Uh, I'll probably um, pass this on to people from Dizal and they can make it available for you afterwards, I guess. I have nothing against it. Okay, I just I just see, thank you. So, uh, thank you. Oh. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's so kind of you. Thanks for Mexico. <laughs>
Thank you from Brazil. <laughs> Thank you. That's really sweet of you. Just compliments. That's the way I like it. <laughs> How many languages do you speak? Well, considering my own criteria <laughs> of what it means to be a bilingual, I would say two. <laughs> uh, broadly speaking, so Leah has the question here. Uh, do you consider teaching children every day, uh, you know, in a regular context, uh, to be a bilingual system? Uh, generally speaking, um, that's that's what I said to you, Leah. Uh, with globalization nowadays, the concept of bilingualism is kind of broadening up. It's kind of becoming a little bit more robust. So every context of a second language learning, um, um, as I said, context could be uh, considered uh, a bilingual context too. I don't know, maybe in the future, we're going to have we're, we're going to have a change in the terminology. Uh, thanks for, from Hugo Rende do Sul, thank you. Um, <laughs> so I'm in Sao Paulo, by the way. Um, so uh, maybe in the future, we're gonna have a change uh, in the terminology and we'll end up having foreign language teaching or learning uh, being much more frequently used for contexts where you really learn English just for one specific uh, purpose. I don't know. When the course is starting again on the 23rd of April, it's going to be a 12 hour, it's going to be a 12 hour course. Thank you. Do you have a LinkedIn account? Yes, I do. It's my name. I, I don't use it very frequently. I should I should use it more, but um, yeah, it's there. It's just my name. Uh, what's your opinion about English courses in Brazil related to learning uh, or acquisition? Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, Brazil, uh, because of the number of learns that we have and because of the sort of investments that uh, investment that um, uh, companies make, Brazil is a real beacon for second language and foreign language acquisition, okay? Uh, I think that the quality of English language teaching and uh, automatically learning in Brazil in certain contexts is a very, 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 is a very good quality. Um, some people are saying, I'm also from Rio Grande do Sul. Yes, but I'm not. <laughs> How can you say, uh, what can you say about second language acquisition and content-based learning? Uh, Valeria, I, I could say a couple of things about those things. And this is a very interesting perspective of bilingualism that people are uh, adopting nowadays. But this is a much more, this is a, a much more contextualized topic in the area of uh, bilingual education. So this has to do with how people concerned with education um, are thinking about the concept of bilingualism. So how can they achieve something which is de generally considered bilingual in contexts where the child won't necessarily have to learn to, to use the foreign language in, on an everyday uh, basis? So this is a very interesting topic, but it's much more connected with bilingual education rather than uh, bilingualism from uh, a linguistic perspective, you know? Uh, how can we enroll to this 12 hour course? You can just access uh, uh, the site of Faculdade Cultura Inglesa. You're gonna find in the extension courses um, some information about this particular course. The course is uh, called Second Language Opposition in E Bilinguismo, Uma Visão Cognitiva. Okay, so time's up. We've reached the end, I guess, of this. So thank you very much once again, and um, see you around. Thank you.